uh, talk more bluntly with journalists. I think to make sure that they understand the full story that we actually actually see out there. I mean, conflict wins more stories, headlines than success in many ways. Um, also, the success tends to be very, very specific. It's an individual mine. It's the Selkirk mine you talked about. Um, it's that kind of thing where it all seems to be quite localized. And when you actually start adding it up and say, gee, actually, we already have several billion dollars in Aboriginal development corporations. Have you ever heard people talk about several billion dollars holding in Aboriginal investment funds? And, you know, take a look at you know, Inuvialu Regional Corporation and see how successful they have been in managing those, those, kinds, of, those kinds of things. I would also say that there's been a misread, in my view, of Idle No More. Um, if Idle No More has one characteristic, it's the largest single public mobilization of people without violence probably in Canadian history. Right? Ponder that for a second. Why was nobody beaten up? Why were there no malls trashed? They, they came into malls in Saskatoon and by in four or 500 people and they danced and they sang and they celebrated and they took pride in being Aboriginal. I think these are somewhat different things. We have to look more subtly at Idle No More. Um, and you, you also mentioned that, that many Aboriginal groups see resource development as a method to preserve their culture. But given very generally that protection of the environment can be perceived or taken to be as a critical point of, of what they believe is a culture, what do you do when Canadian general sentiment reflected in the election, reflected in the, the current government today, with their views on how to handle resource management and environmental governance, which you know sparked the antagonism over the last year? Um, it, it's a really interesting one. I mean, if you look at the Northern Territories, for example, they have sufficient controls under modern treaties, under local regional sort of management systems to make sure that their own imperatives they're on, uh, you know, are heard. They have a whole bunch of boards and things in place. Um, I think the fact that Aboriginal folks to do to consult and accommodate have to be listened to in ways that just didn't exist 15 years ago. They have a legal requirement. Con duty to consult and accommodate doesn't mean you just go up there and say we're coming. It means you actually find out what the impact is, you talk them through it. And Aboriginal groups are getting more and more capability within their own communities to sort of answer back to the experts, answer back to the Southern Mining Corporations or even the government officials, and they can hold their own. Um, and I think we're getting more successful examples of that, where um, a mine resource development with substantial Aboriginal participation is, is likely to be sort of done within a, the parameters that they're comfortable with. Um, Aboriginal community after Aboriginal community says, we're not opposed to development. We're opposed to development done poorly. Mm -hmm. And so they want to know what, they want to be part of the process. They want to be integral to the whole development sort of initiative and be part of the evaluation as it goes on. Um, and where that's been happening, it's not bad. It's not bad. Sorry. Uh, uh, Hugh Windsor, Global Mail. Uh, my question's for Doug uh, and uh, uh, it's probably the pessimism side rather than the optimism side that uh, Dr. Coates was talking about. Uh, many of us remember that famous photograph of the soldier uh, staring down an Oka warrior. Uh, I don't know how many years ago that was now, but it was, uh, it, it's, it's a lasting iconic image. Uh, what are the implications for the Canadian forces in your research, and uh, does it mean a, a new kind of training or a new kind of uh, person recruited or whatever? Uh, I mean, if, if we get to major, major civic disruption, as happened with the Oka um, crisis, uh, we, our fallback were, were the Canadian forces. Mm -hmm. So uh, take off from there. <coughs> Hugh, um, I was at a conference uh, with military officers uh, <laughs> a year or so ago, and I was talking about this topic, and uh, really I was talking about the circumstances of Aboriginal people, where they live, the fact that 80% of the prisoners in uh, Western Canada penitentiaries are Aboriginals, and, and, and these kinds of facts and figures. Uh, halfway through the presentation, the, the commanding officer of that particular unit asked me to stop talking. Um, I deserve to be kicked off a lot of stages, but I didn't think I'd get kick, kicked off that one. The, um, the attitude in, the public attitude in uh, the military and in the police, especially the OVP in, uh, in Ontario, is that it's not that there isn't any problem, uh, but we're not going to enforce the law and then create a problem. Julian Fantino, uh, when he was 
uh, commissioner of the OPP uh, was at Caledonia, and you'll remember that uh, uh, big uh, dust up there. At Caledonia, there were very clear evidence, examples, photographs of Aboriginal people off reserve uh, attacking uh, white guys, uh, damaging property, and so on. And a reporter asked Santino when he came down to the site, he said, why aren't your officers enforcing the law? And Julian Fantino gave us the answer for perhaps your question. He said to, to the reporter, if I enforce the law here, it will cause an uprising across the country, and we can't stand that. So there has been a great deal of resistance uh, um, from uh, chiefs of defense staff over the years, uh, senior police officers and so on, to avoid getting into a direct confrontation with uh, Aboriginal protesters, even if they're small uh, bodies, uh, for fear of uh, a contagion of some sort going uh, across the country. And that's part of the vulnerability uh, of the system. We saw it in a small way, if I continue for just a second, we saw it in a small way, you remember the G8 meetings um, uh, were uh, happening in Toronto at about the same time somebody wanted to change the um, HST tax system and apply it uh, in unusual ways to uh, reserves in Ontario especially. Uh, the chiefs met with uh, officials and said, well, you, you either don't charge us those taxes or, you're, or you have a G8 meeting. Which would you like? And the government changed its mind on the HTS, um, HST uh, tax system. So there is there is implicit power uh, in the system and people worry about it. And uh, in some respects, they have a right to worry about it. But in the idea of feasibility, uh, Aboriginal leaders peaceful ones and not so peaceful ones understand that they do have power and that they're willing to use it uh, occasionally as it's necessary. The armed forces and the police understand that too and they don't want anything to do with it. But what was the trigger then in Oka that uh, there was a different attitude? Oka uh, was um, a particular event that became particularly violent, was out of control. The, the um, Sûreté de Quebec uh, took off, ran away. Uh, there was no police force. So the armed forces were, were br brought in and aided the civil power operation to not so much to establish order, but to intimidate the so-called warrior, native warriors who were on, on the scene. And it worked that time. Um, but what I would recommend, uh, uh, Hugh, that uh, Take a look at a book by uh, Harry Swain. Harry Swain was the Assistant Deputy Minister for Aboriginal Affairs at that time, very sympathetic to the Aboriginal cause. And in, in his new book, uh, which came out last year, the year before, uh, he describes what the government did at OCA that most people don't understand or know about, in that he and the government and other people and police people went across the country to reserves and spoke with the chiefs, the reasonable people that Ken talks, talks about, and said, you guys stay out of this. And they did. We're not so sure they'd do that now. John Iveson, National Post. Just to, to wrap up, uh, maybe from Brian, we've got the potential for progress, we've got the potential for disaster. Do, have you got a conclusion or a consensus view on where it may go? Well, um, we think that uh, on balance uh, there is uh, strong reason for optimism. Uh, that's the reason we started this project and by the way uh, I, I, I'd like to mention that this project uh, arose out of a conversation that I had with uh, the then CEO of the uh, Assembly of First Nations, Richard Jock, who uh, said to me, look, you know, uh, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians alike need to have a source of thoughtful, nonpartisan, you know, uh, uh, arm's length uh, suggestions, policy commentary, the impression that uh, this is uh, an intractable problem on which no progress can ever be made. Part of what we're saying is that's not true. Uh, as we roll out the rest of this project, we will be talking in more detail about the best practices that are working uh, in the country, resource sharing already at work in various forms in British Columbia and some of the territories and so, so on, the development uh, corporations that uh, uh, that Ken's talked about. We think that there, uh, uh, if, if you think about the, um, what Doug has said about um, uh, 
uh, undermining the feasibility of uh, insurrection or um, uh, other kinds of violent demonstration, part of uh, uh, the strategy for that, he says, is to find ways to have people take ownership, to have a piece of uh, the pie, to have a job, to have an education, to have an investment in uh, these development corporations and others. And so we think that these, these things all fit together. It's not, uh, we're not suggesting uh, uh, that progress can be made because we want to avoid insurrection. Avoiding insurrection will be a benefit of getting these things right. Uh, and um, everyone here, I don't want to leave anyone in any doubt, all three of us uh, are, um, are optimists about this. We believe that uh, if we take the right steps, that we will get an outcome that Canadians, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, will be proud of. And that will be a, a, a major step forward for Canada. Peter, would you like a follow-up? Yeah, just a uh, follow-up. Uh, we all know from the Quebec nationalist movement that uh, even federalists in Quebec use this idea of separation as a quote-unquote knife at the throat of the rest of Canada. It sounds like what you're describing here is that the violence insurrection thing is the knife at the throat. I'm wondering if you guys are at all concerned that you're encouraging that, legitimizing that, that a young Aboriginal person, 24 year old, years old, could be watching this and saying, geez, maybe I should be a warrior. These guys are saying I should be a warrior if, I'm, if we don't get what we want. Well, Peter, I, I, I don't think that that's what we're saying. In fact, I think we're saying something quite different. What we're saying is that without any help from us, if Canada doesn't do the right thing, if we don't build the right relationship, if we don't get the right institutions to manage the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians, they'll figure that out for themselves. Uh, what we want to do is we want to undermine the conditions in which it is worthwhile for them to do so. I think that's a completely different approach. And the, the follow-up to that, Northern Gateway, uh, you know, you're a big uh, fan of this project. Is in your report, I believe, or in your discussion, you're talking about the concerns about the environment and the, you know, the legitimate concerns that First Nations have. There are, there are obviously First Nations in that area that are concerned about the salmon industry, tourism industry, that sort of thing. If this project was in any way imposed on them, obviously there's some First Nations that support it, but there are others that don't. Aren't you in turn legitimizing the possibility of that pipeline going through with the First Nations that don't agree with it? You know, the, maybe we should uh, sabotage this pipeline. Well, uh, Ken may have uh, thoughts about this. Uh, all I'll say is that uh, everything that we have said so far about the way that the natural resource economy uh, uh, should be developed in partnership with Aboriginal people is based on that notion of partnership. Um, we think that we, that, that Aboriginal people uh, have all the tools necessary to uh, defend their interests, uh, which include uh, being very concerned about the environment, about not wanting to see development damage uh, their culture, uh, their uh, natural environment, uh, and uh, uh, other aspects of uh, community life. Uh, as Ken said, you know, uh, uh, the vast majority of Aboriginal leaders and communities out there uh, want development. They don't want bad development. And we're talking about how we're going to find the institutions and the rules and the understandings that will allow us to promote good development that wins the support of Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people alike. Ken, did you want to add? Just to really quickly pick up on that. You'll remember in the 1970s, we had a proposal for a Mackenzie Valley natural gas pipeline. Um, at the time, uh, some of the more radical, uh, more outspoken Aboriginal leaders said, you can't defend a 1,500 mile long pipeline.